All right, Acts chapter number 16, if you will. Acts chapter 16. That is a great song. By the way, I forgot to mention the offering box in the back. Make sure you're taking care of uh, helping with the, uh, um, the bills and, and the, the new roof and all the good stuff that's going on here. Make sure you're participating in that. If you are online, you can donate through the PayPal button. That's on the website if you'd like to do that, or you can drop it in the mail. We take checks and cash and coin, okay? So um, we, that's about all we take. Uh, but you can use PayPal on the website. That's there as well. Uh, Acts chapter number 16, if you will. We're going to continue our study in our ambassadorship. And, and we introduced last time uh, really the two areas of our ambassadorship, the issue of the gospel and then the issue of the grace life. And so we're talking about the gospel this morning. I'm, uh, the, the title of the message is Confusing the Gospel. Uh, last week we ended with the issue of looking at and understanding and that you have to understand when you talk about the gospel, the dispensational distinctions that are there. Remember I gave you those, you got the gospel of the circumcision, you got the gospel of the kingdom, you've got the gospel of... Um, the uncircumcision, you got the gospel of the grace of God, you got the gospel of God, the gospel of Christ, the gospel of peace, you got all these different gospels, and you have to be able to, to make, you have to understand that, there are, that one group's talking about Israel's program, and the other group is talking about the body of Christ, and keeping those distinct, and those, um, quite honestly, those in the right categories that they belong in. And that really comes to the issue of understanding the word rightly divided. And, and it's, off, it's awesome, I think, sometimes, for me anyway, I hope it is for you to understand the necessity of understanding how to rightly divide your Bible. And how to, when you come to it, to understand right division. You know, we talk about right division, and we talk about understanding the distinctions that are in Scripture, not so that we can say we know more than somebody else. Because there will always be someone who knows more than you do. You know, there's there, it's just the, the laws of uh, Murphy and the laws of life. It's just that way, okay? But whether when we talk about understanding right division and the necessities of it, it's so that when we come in our ambassadorship speaking for Christ, that we do so in a proper manner, in, in, a, in a manner in which what, is, what the words of Christ are going to be spoken. Uh, in, in Romans 3, Paul Talking about Israel, he calls them that they first received, they, they received the oracles of God. Wow, what a word. I love that. By the way, when we get back on the radio, that's going to be the title of the radio program, the oracles of God. It's just, and actually the oracles of grace is what it's going to be, but just the, or, the word of God. And when you come to the word of God, and what does God have to say for me today in the age of grace, and the, the necessity for understanding Rightly, right division is to have the ability to define the gospel and then to be able to go and defend it. And if you can't rightly divide the word and you don't understand what that is, then you're not going to be able to accurately define the gospel. Today we're going to talk about the gospel, today and next week. Then we're going to go over and look at the grace life and, and what it is to live life as who you are in Christ how grace is designed to work in your life. You know, even amongst grace believers, that is such a, a weird idea of how that's to fluctuate and how that's to work. And, and, what, and so we're going to look at that, and we're going to see then how the adversary attacks that life, just as he attacks the gospel. And we need to know how to not only define the gospel against the, the, the uses of scriptural but not dispensational, we need to know how to defend it. We need to understand that when we hear it, to identify it and to check it and to move it to the side. One of the brothers gave me a book from an outfit. Thing is beautiful. Man, it's well, it's well written. It's well wordy. But you know what? At the bottom end of it, it's all a work salvation. That's all that it is. It's a works gospel. Looks good. You present it, give it, boom. It's just, it's like, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> Well, that's wrong, and that's wrong, and that's and you begin to check. Not again, not to say that we know more than the other guy, but to say that hey, here's where the truth is, and we need to know that we have the truth, and we need to be able to distinguish between Israel's gospel message 
and then the message given to the body of Christ. And when we can do that, then we can function uh, properly, if you will, as the ambassadors for Christ. Romans 16, I'm sorry, Acts 16 and verse number 30. A very familiar passage with us. It's the Philippian jailer, Paul and, and the boys and Silas, verse 25, and at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Isn't that interesting what Paul and Silas did? Notice there, I'm, I'm in Acts 16, 25. I'm sorry. I moved up so you could get the context, okay? Here they are, they're in jail. What's their situation? It isn't 95, sunshine, beautiful, just had a great spread to eat in halftime and all that stuff. It isn't that at all. They're down in prison, aren't they? And what did they do? Look at verse 25. They prayed, and again, prayer is just talking to God about the Word of God and how to, put, how to bring the Word of God into the details of life. And then they sang praises. You know what they sang? He lives. And because I know He lives, I can do what? face tomorrow. See, and, and the prisoners heard it. Isn't that interesting? But what else did the, what else was Paul doing down there? They were praying and singing and praying. Well, then all of a sudden he got, a, he got an earthquake, verse 26. Everybody set free, verse 27. The keeper of the prison, waking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out a sword and would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had been fled. And Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in, came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. I mean, great. By the way, you know what the jailer knew was going to happen? If they had all run, the Roman guillotine was coming. Because they've already lost Paul once or twice here. <laughs> and, but notice verse 30. And, the, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Isn't that an interesting question? So when Paul and Silas were praying, what do you think their audible prayer sounded like? Dear Father, we thank you for the circumstances we're in. We thank you for the fact that there's a guy listening to us right now who's lost. He's a sinner. He needs to go to hell. He's going to hell. He needs to get a savior. And you're the savior and just preaches the gospel in a prayer. Because that's all prayer is, is talking to the Father. Not every head bowed, every eye closed. Not down on the kneeling benches. Well, we, we don't have those. Okay, those hurt. You get down, you can't get up. <laughs> I always thought, I always looked at that and said, you know, people are kneeling down there. They're probably praying, Lord, help me up. You know, just get me up. <laughs> Sorry, I, that's what I'd be praying. <laughs> get down there, can't get. No, look at what they're doing because of the question that's asked. Job, in Job, Job 9, uh, verse number 1 and verse number 2, the question of the ages is, is how is a man just before God? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now watch Paul's response, verse 31. And they said, believe and be baptized, walk the aisle, join the church, do all this. No, he doesn't say that at all, does he? What does he say? He says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. He says, you, you can be saved and everyone that hears the gospel message in your household and in your company, you know what they can do? If they just simply believe the Lord Jesus Christ, and they can get saved. Amen? That's it. Nothing else. It's a clear statement of how a lost man can be saved is right there. Believe. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. All he has to do is to do nothing but believe. Now, look real quick with me to Acts 2. Hold on to 16. Run back to Acts 2, but notice the contrast here. Acts chapter 2. In Acts 2, you have the day of Pentecost. You have Peter and the, and the boys, or the, the 11, are up preaching and teaching. Well, actually, it's, all, it's Peter and the 11, because so the 12 are all her old now. And they're out preaching to the men of Israel and all those in Judea, which are uh, Israel, the Jews. They preach a message of how, and they indict them of really killing in the, the Messiah. Verse number 37, now when they heard this, they, and that's the audience, was pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What do we do to be saved, Pete? Verse 38, 
Then he said unto them, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Not at all, isn't it? What did he say? He said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's a little different than 1631, isn't it? So then which one's right? See, well, they're both right, but which one is dispensationally correct? Roman or Acts 16, go back there. Though you know what John the Baptist says? Repent and be baptized. You know what the Lord Jesus Christ says? Repent and be baptized. Then the rich young ruler comes to him and says, Sir, what must I do to have eternal life? And you know what the Lord does? He adds to the equation, says, Keep the commandments. Who oh, is right? And he says, I did, I've done them all. And the Lord goes, Yeah, but you missed one over here. Peter says, repent and be baptized. Now Paul shows up and says, simply believe. That's why understanding right division and where things are fitting in your scripture is so vitally critical to your eternal life and to your Christian life. Because if you, and then it's even as critical to you and I as ambassadors, as we're out talking to people who will have all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Paul just shows up and says, this. The, the, the simple thing is, is for you to believe. And again, the answer to the apparent contradiction is a dispensational answer. That's the answer. Notice verse 32, 1632. And they spake unto him, now notice, the word of the Lord unto all that were in his house. What did Paul and Silas do to that Philippian jailer? The jailer goes, sirs, what must we do to be saved? Paul says, you just need to simply believe the Lord Jesus Christ. And the, uh, you, can, you, know the con you, you can imagine the conversation. Okay, what is that? What are you talking about? And what does verse 32 say he did? He spake unto him the what? The word of the Lord. He didn't pull out a dictionary or a theology book. He preached what? The word. Come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Notice the first four verses, what he preached to this man. And the reason why this is important is because when we get over here in a minute talking about how you're going to confuse the gospel and how your terminology and the things you're going to say, what did Paul do? He simply preached the word. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, 2, 3, and 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. Here's the word of the Lord, which also ye have received, and wherein you stand, by which also ye are saved. When I come to talk to you about the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ and His death, burial, and resurrection here, when He gets down in it, that's what saved you. If somebody ever asks you, are you born again? You better be saying, no, I am saved. Born again belongs to Israel. That's Israel's terminology. By the way, if somebody ever asks that or you ask, and they give you that response, ask them what it means. Don't jump on them. Okay? If I can give you from experience, don't beat them upside the side of the head with right division. Ask them what they mean. Because nine out of ten times, you know what they mean? They're saved. They just have bad terminology. They have confusing terminology. Paul, he spoke, he goes, here's the gospel by which you're saved. And you know what it is? For I delivered, verse 3, unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scripture, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Folks, you know what the message is? The message is, is the wrath of God was poured out on the Lord Jesus Christ when He died. And when He died, He took care of the penalty and the payment of sin for the whole world, for everyone. And what He does there is when He paid for it, by the way, the burial, don't forget the burial and resurrection. Because you know what the resurrection says? Paid in full. Look over back with me to Romans chapter number 4. By the way, you're going to need 2 Corinthians 11 too. But Romans chapter number 4 first. 
Romans 4 and verse number 25. Romans 4 and verse number 25. When we talk about the, the gospel and those elements that we discuss and we're going to discuss more again next time, you have to understand that you have to, not only do you got to have his death, but you got to have his burial and you got to have his resurrection. Because if he, Romans 4.25 says, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. You know what declares you to be justified? When you have faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll be honest with you, you can run into religions all across the, the, the world, the continent. You know what they believe in? They believe in a debt that Christ died. They believe in it. But they also say you've got to do something to help him. They will go even to a burial and resurrection, but now they've got to do this over here. See, 2 Corinthians 11. So it's important to know the issue of the gospel. It's important to understand that when we talk about the gospel, that we're clear with it. Next time, we'll talk about the three elements in it. We'll talk about the issues. We'll talk about how to deal, how to, you know, what's happening. Because you can give the gospel, add some confusing terminology to it, and make the gospel of none effect. That's 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17. Okay, the wisdom of words. We've talked about that. Look at 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 3. If you were following on Twitter or Facebook, I posted a little note about this this morning. Because it's always amazing to me how people miss what's going on with the simplicity that's in Christ. Because they tried to, if it's simple in Christ, who made it hard? We did. Then knock it off. Relax. Sit there. Enjoy who you are in Christ. Look at verse 3. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility. I just had to say it. Subtility, okay? So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. As the serpent beguiled Eve. How did he beguile Eve? Remember Genesis 3? Yea, hath God said. And then he causes Eve to add to the word, question the word, Subtract. Satan comes in then and waters it down. And he got Eve to leave the simplicity of who she was in Christ. To look over here at some lesser identification issues, the angelic host. And to move from being a, 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 someone who was made in the image of God down into a lesser situation. And did it by saying, yea, hath God said. Did God really mean what he said? And she took it hook, line, and sinker. That word simplicity means that it's unmixed. It's not a complicated deal. It's not a bunch of ideas that are you know, forced together. Rather, the simplicity that's in Christ simply means really what he did is not mixed with anything that you did. You do nothing to add anything to his activity and to his work. You follow that? Hopefully I'm preaching to the crowd, to the choir, okay? Satan's tactic, come back to chapter 3, Satan's tactic, the adversary's motive is going to come in and to corrupt that simplicity. And when he does that, he's going to come in and he's going to cause us to mix with what Christ has done with a works program. And he's going to come in and he's going to cause you to jumble it all up. Because you're going to get this wonderful thing out there that's called evangelicalism out here. And you go, man, we got to be like those guys. And you know what happens? Then we start cherry picking some of their, they have some great marketing tools. They're very wise that way. So you get out there and you start cherry picking stuff. And the next thing you know, you've moved so far away from the Word of God that when you're witnessing to people, all you're doing is telling them a story that sounds good rather than the truth that Christ died for their sins. 2 Corinthians 3, verse number 12. A verse that you probably need to, 
to memorize, keep in the back of your mind, have on, a, on, a, on, on the front of your mind. Notice the verse, seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. The hope in the context, honestly, has to do with the finished work of Christ at Calvary. Okay? There's that putting away of the works program, the stuff there about Moses and the veil and all that stuff. But notice what Paul says, how did we speak? With great, what? Plainness of speech. He says, we use this, we come in, and the terminology we use in communicating the gospel, we did it in such plainness that you guys got it. We didn't come in and have it all jumbled up and be big fancy words. Well, the eschatology of the environment. And, and all. What? No, you come in and you use a plainness of speech. So the terminology that we use is very important. And when we, so we're going to talk about terminology and things that happen. Because when we use words to communicate the gospel, as an ambassador, what words are we, whose words are we supposed to be using? Christ's words, his words, the word of the Lord. So we have to be very careful that we don't bring in us because we, we, we got this idea over here that it needs to look this way. So we have to be careful. We have to be clear and concise. And we have to communicate what Christ would have us communicate. So our terminology is faulty. Okay? So these are the negative things. Our terminology is faulty if it fails to provide an adequate basis for our faith to rest in. Come over to Romans 3 and verse 25. Our terminology is faulty if it fails to provide an adequate basis for our faith to rest in. Folks, the issue when you're giving the gospel isn't that somebody has faith. The issue is what do they believe in? What are they placing their faith in? It's the object of that faith. Romans 3.25 Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remissions of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Notice the first half of that word. By the way, there's another big word, propitiation. Get Dictionary of the Gospel, learn what some of these words mean. Propitiation just simply means fully satisfied payment. It's done. Okay, it's, there's no more. But your, your, our terminology is faulty when we don't provide an adequate basis for our faith to rest in. Where is our faith to rest in according to 325? In His blood. It's faith in His sacrifice at Calvary, and that's what satisfies. So if I'm over here using terminology that doesn't drive someone to that, then you know what I need to do? Be quiet. Okay? That's a nice way of saying, shut up. All right? But we don't use the S word, okay? You need to be quiet. Our terminology, the second point, is faulty if it implies that something other than exercising faith is necessary in order to be saved. You're in Romans 3, turn the chapter to chapter 4. Folks, if you tell somebody they got to do something other than just simply believing the Word, your, term, your terms are faulty, you're hurting the situation. Romans 4 and verse number 16, Therefore it is of faith, that it might be of be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. Notice the first of that verse. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by what? What if you add works to it? Then it's no more what? Grace. Romans eleven six. We have to maintain grace, don't we, in our terminology. And if we don't, and by the way, all of this applies to your life too. The grace life things, we're going to see that when we get over there. Our terminology is faulty if it causes the unbeliever to depend upon his emotions, his subjectivity for his assurance. You tell him how you feel. Did you feel it? Folks, when you got saved, you didn't feel the operation of God. 
You only know that he went to work on you because the book of Colossians chapter number 2 tells you he went to work on you. You only know that from studying the Word. Well, but I, I, if I had a tingle down my spine. Well, that wasn't God. <laughs> that, was the, if you're, that was a young dude or young lady sitting next to you. Got you all worked up, you know. That's something else. That's not God. Now, it isn't to say that there isn't emotions involved in it. I've seen people get saved and they're just on the floor bawling their eyes out, but not out of placing their faith in, in something that they're doing, but rather coming to an acknowledgement of what Christ has done for them and the sheer joy and the release of the happiness of it. So if you use terminology that causes that unbeliever to depend on something else, please be quiet. You're hurting yourself. You need to go in and figure out what's going on. Our terminology, point number four, is becomes faulty if it, declare, if it fails to declare that the issue is believing in Him. You ask the question, what are you, if you, is what you are depending upon adequate to save you? That's what you ask them. Well, I'm a good guy. You think that's going to get the job done? The answer is no. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understands. There's not. You can't get there on your own. Our terminology, the last point, is faulty if it deals too lightly with sin and its consequences. And I'll be honest with you, this one's the hardest. This is the most dangerous of them all. They're all dangerous. But this one, because you know what we tend to do? We tend to lighten the issue of hell. And we fail to convey to the unbeliever the horrors of, his, of him being lost. And our terminology fails then to communicate the gospel. Because we don't want to offend them. Folks, hell, the lake of fire, the second death, is the place where the fire is not quenched and the worm dieth not. You can't sugarcoat that. It's a place where all... Uh, that Man, Revelation 21.8... They got a big old list of bad guys, and then right in the middle of it sticks all liars. Ooh, they're going to have their place in the lake of fire. But when you talk about hell, and we've studied hell and the doctrine of hell, we're talking about eternal damnation. We, I, heard, I was talking to a guy a couple weeks ago at the bus yard, and he said something about hell, and I said, yeah, you don't want to really go there, do you? And he goes, ah, all my friends are going to be there. You've heard that. I'm like, Really? How do you know that? Oh, well, you know what, man? We party hard and let God sort them all out on Sunday, you know? We're all in the... And I'm like, really? Oh, okay. I said, well, do you really know what hell is? Oh, it's some fictional thing made up by the priest just to keep us in check. I'm like, really? So I got to talking to him about hell. The, the guy walked away from me. He's like, no. I said, dude, do you remember? You, this is what it is. You go run over there to Luke and you use the rich man in Lazarus. You need to know that pair. It's not a... You need to know that information. Okay, it's not a parable, by the way. If anybody ever says that Luke 16 is a parable on you, you say, that's fine. Do you understand what a parable is? Because a parable is a story about a real thing, just talked about in terms that others can understand. That's all a parable is. Well, it's a parable. Okay, good. Do you, do you know what a parable is? That means that everything the Lord said about the rich man and Lazarus is true. Whether it's a parable or not. Anyway, take that for... That's a sidelight. No, that's an extra. The problem with faulty terminology is that what we begin to do is we begin to use the modern popular appeals in, in our gospel presentation. And when we begin to give the gospel... Rather than focusing on it being faith in the gospel message that allows you to be saved, believing the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, unto everyone that believes, rather than focusing there, we come over and we begin to use the popular terminology because it makes us sound good. It moves us away from the simplicity that's in Christ. And I'll be honest with you, problem areas begin to develop when you begin to tell people the gospel and then you begin to add something 
to it. And you literally make that gospel message of none effect. So there's lots of popular expressions. We're going to talk about a few of them here for the next few minutes that we are all very familiar with. And the popular expressions, they just, honestly, they just simply confuse the unbeliever. I'll be honest with you. They sit really in two categorical two categories, unscriptural. So basically they are wrong. They, they're, they're not Bible-based. They're based in a theology and in a marketing program. And the other category is that they're really not intended for the unbeliever. They're intended for the believer. <laughs> but when you use them and you begin to use these terminologies and these little catchphrases, you know what begins to happen? Not only do you have to you confuse the unbeliever, but now you've got to come over here and spend time explaining what you meant. Rather than just simply saying that for all have sinned, and he died for all, and your, your responsibility is just simply believe it. See? Now we're going to use an expression like you must give your heart to Christ. Have you make, make your commitment to Christ. This is the first one, okay? I got about six of them. All right? Give your heart to Christ. Now, that sounds great, doesn't it? And it sounds good, and it's romantic, and it conveys it, but it lacks any adequate basis for salvation. Because given to your heart to Christ implies you have to do what? You got to do something. You got to give your heart to Christ. You got to do a work, don't you? So then, what did you say? Lord, it's not enough. You died for me, but now I'm going to come along and help you out. Are you, you're in Romans, right? Look at Romans 3. And look at verse 24. Romans 3 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Folks, salvation is God's gift to us. It's not us giving God anything. Now, don't get me wrong. I understand the appeal to give your heart to Christ and commit, make the commitment and everything. I got that, and I understand. And, but you know what, though? When an, for an unsaved person, what did that register in his mind? That he gets to play a part in the situation. And that's dangerous. Hold on to Romans. And by the way, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. It's the gift. Come back to Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23. This idea about giving your heart to Christ, and in a minute we're going to talk about lordship salvation, making him Lord of your life, is a scriptural idea. Okay? Now listen to me closely. It is a scriptural idea. It is Proverbs 23. It is just not designed for the unbeliever. It's designed for the believer. Proverbs 23, verse 26. My son, give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. What does the writer say? What does Solomon say? What's David say there? Son, give me thine heart. See, give your heart to Jesus. But wait a minute. Isn't the son already established as the, the son here? He's already the son. He's already a believer. He's already in the family of God. And what's the desire of the father? Give me your heart. Make the commitment to it. The relationship is already established. Now that you're my son, give me your allegiance, your devotion. 23, 26. Proverbs 23, 26. Okay? The problem with saying, give me your heart, is when, the unbel when they hear this, the unbeliever, they don't understand. They don't understand Proverbs 23. And I'll be honest with you, every Christian that says that doesn't understand Proverbs 23. Because they sat through an evangelistic training class that said, you got to do it this way. So you have to explain it. You cause the unbeliever to think he has to do something. 
not just don't need to use that kind of terminology. Give your heart to Christ. You don't need it. It's not designed for the unbeliever. It's literally designed for the believer. The second one that we like to use or we hear used, I hope you don't use any of these. <laughs> I've been trying to beat it out of you now for six weeks. <laughs> okay. All right, good. All right. You must open up the door of your heart. Ask Jesus to come into your heart. Open the door and let Christ come in. He's knocking. Again, you can say that. Okay? And you can mean the right thing by it. The problem is, you have to explain what it means. Because the unbeliever guy is thinking what? I get to do something. It's confusing to the unsaved. By the way, is, is that, I'm um, behold, I stand at the door and knock? Isn't that scriptural? It's the book of Revelation. It's just not meant for an unbeliever. It's meant for a believer. You must surrender everything to Jesus. Surrender all and make the Lord, Lord of your life. That issue of lordship salvation. Folks, I'm going to tell you what, as a believer, you better do that. As a believer... As a Bible believer, you better surrender everything to the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not your own. You've been bought with the price. You belong to Him. You better turn it all over to Him. But as a believer, you do that. Not as an unbeliever. As an unbeliever, what is he thinking? Hey, I get to do something. Or, as an unbeliever, you know what they say? I don't want that because I don't want to give up. My drinking, my smoking, my pizza, all that stuff. Because what does it trigger? It triggers, I got to now live a holy life over here. Now I got to get cleaned up. And man, if I'm going to turn everything over to him, I got to clean this up. I don't want to give up that stuff. So I'm going to say no to Calvary. Wait a minute. Now, by the way, where does that life get cleaned up? But where? On the other side of Calvary. Not before Calvary. I had a guy, I talked to a guy when I was living in California, there in San Clemente, Andy, my roommate, and I, we were out walking around. We'd been down to the beach and doing what we do at the beach and watch the girls go by and wish we could surf and we're 30 pounds lighter and wish I had a cute little puppy dog that everybody would do, oh, you know. We were just down there goofing around. We're on our way back up and we run into a guy who's our neighbor, a couple houses down, and we've been witnessing to this guy. We've been talking to him and stuff. And he goes, hey, why don't you guys come over later? We're going to be cooking out and just chill, hanging out, you know, hang loose, guys, you know. I'm like, okay, so we go over. This guy gets saved. The problem is, is you know what he doesn't want to do? He don't want to go to church. He said it. He goes, Rick, I don't want to give up my beer. I don't want to give up my pizza. I don't want to give up my football on Sunday. And I don't want to go to church. And I said, good, you don't have to. Because you don't. What do you have to do? Believe that Christ died for your sins. Right? Now we sit over there a little later. I'm talking to him and said, you know, hey, by the way, there's another component to this. And you need to come to understand some stuff. And he said, I told you I don't. This is his word verbatim. I told you I don't want to give up that. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. Here's the name and number of John Verstegen, church here in town. Here's my name and number. If you ever change your mind, we're right here for you. As far as I know, that guy never reached out. But you know what had happened in his career, in his life? Somebody had come along and said, you got to make the Lord Lord of your life, and you got to give up all of this lifestyle. Do you know how you change lifestyle? Paul says you put off the old man and you put on the new man. But who does that? The believer does that. You're given the gospel... Don't make the unbeliever a believer before he's a believer. Don't use the terminology. It's confusing. Is it right? Is it legit? Yes, but for who? For the believer. You guys follow that? All right, I hope so. You must confess your sins and ask the Lord to forgive you. Ooh. 
What does God want for the unbeliever? What does God want for that unsaved person? What does He really want for them? Does He really want them bowed down asking for them to for Him to forgive him? No, I don't think so. You know what they you know what He wants for the unbeliever? He wants that unbeliever to recognize their sinful condition. Because if you're not lost, you don't need a savior. You understand that. Now, is forgiveness of sins and all that coming? Yes, it is. But not you don't put the cart before the horse. That's what that phrase, by the way, does. Puts the cart before the horse. Forgive me my sins. And everyone that I don't remember to tell you to keep track of, then do that one too. Uh-uh. Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm your enemy. And I don't want that anymore. You see, what God wants for the unsaved person is for them to recognize their sinful condition. So asking God to forgive you of your sins is not adequate because the basis has to be upon what? Faith first. Follow that? That's a, that's a big one. Just ask Christ to forgive your sins. And here's the next big one. <laughs> You must confess all your sins to Christ, and you must turn from your sins and receive Christ. Turn or burn. So they use words like repentance and penitence and penitence. Penitence, P-E-N-A-N-C-E, and penitence, P-E-N-P-E-N-I-T-E. Okay? They begin to use words. The problem is, is they don't understand the words they're using. You must confess all of your sins. You must turn from your sins and receive Christ. Any terminology like that that deals with sin this way is very confusing because it's a misunderstanding of terms. Repent and be baptized. What does that word repentance mean? By the way, the Bible word is repentance or repent. What does that word mean? To change a mind. That's all that it means. Now, when you're unsaved and you hear the gospel message, do you not repent and change your mind about who you were? Well, yeah. Duh. Okay? When you, as a believer, and you commit a sin, don't you repent and change your mind about, hey, I shouldn't be doing that activity anymore, and let's put that off and let's put on something else? Yeah, you do. That's good. Penitence is a payment for sin. Penitence is a sorrow for sin. So, I, you know, you must be sorry for your sins. Well, how sorry do I have to be? <laughs> you have to be real sorry. That's the Billy Graham thing, okay? We were up at Wheaton College one year for the Bible conference, and Wheaton has a bit... The university there has a big uh, Billy Graham Center, okay? Old, old man Billy Graham. I, well, there's only one Billy Graham. He's Franklin. Anyway, and you punch the button and he gives the gospel. And it's a works gospel. And at the end, he says, you need to be sorry for your sins. And he says, how sorry? Real sorry. That's why I said it that way. I'm like, okay. Big old picture and everything. See, in Scripture, repentance is the word that you're, that you're talking about. It's a changing of mind. And when you take the three and you confuse them and you make it a payment for sin and a being a sorry for sin, and what you really wind up with is a mess. Folks, when you give the gospel to an unbeliever, what do they need to understand? They need to understand their sinful condition, don't they? They need to change their mind about that, that they can't do it, that what they need is a Savior. They need a Redeemer. They need a Helper. And He died over there at Calvary, and by me placing my faith, the object of my faith is in what He did at Calvary. Then and then alone does the power of God unto salvation come into play. The last one, you must pray the sinner's prayer. Call on the name of the Lord in order to be saved. Now, we're going to talk about some of that in Romans 10 next time, okay? Do you know that the Bible does not say anywhere that I know of that you've got to pray to be saved in either program, Israel's or ours? You know who developed that? Religion did. 
You know what it says in the Bible? It says believe to be saved. It doesn't say pray to be saved. It says believe to be saved. Folks, we want to communicate to people, and we want to listen for these things. We want to define the gospel. We want to defend the gospel. And when we communicate to people about the gospel that Christ fully paid for their sins and that their only response is a response of faith to that message, we want to be as clear as clear can be and not use the confusing terminology because when you confuse the gospel and you add in dribbles of this or that, doesn't that all that sound good? Boy, it sounds real good. You know, makes you feel good. It's romantic. It's not as harsh as looking at someone. I looked at a guy one time years ago. I was catching shoplifters for bashes, and I caught a guy, and he came up, and he his excuse for stealing was he was a Christian, and he was down on his luck. And I said, really? Okay, that's, I've never heard a Christian defense. <laughs> so I listened to him, and I just looked at him and said, you know what, you're just a, law, you're just a lost, hell-bound sinner. And he goes, you offended me. I said, good, I'm glad I did. Now the cops are coming, so sit there and be quiet. Because i got to get my stuff done <laughs> for the officer when he comes. <laughs> you know, It's hard to tell people that they're lost sinners, hellbound, because you care for them. Paul says, am I your enemy because I tell you the truth? That's what you got to do. We want to be good ambassadors for Christ, don't we? We want to understand. We, so, so in order to do that, you know what we have to do? We have to honor. We, you know what we have to do? We have to make it clear. I had a whole paragraph I was going to read to you. <laughs> As an editor, you cut, 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 and cut more. So I cut. <laughs> you know what we want to do? We want to honor the gospel of the grace of God by being clear. Not using little trickery things. Because the salvation of souls is what is at stake. Just as we talked about in the evangelism seminar, first two months, as we're going to continue to talk now, folks, being you're dealing with people and their eternity. And that's critical. And it's critical that you're clear with that. Next time, we'll talk more about the gospel. We're going to look at that Romans 10 about the confession thing, stuff like that, because people get into that, and I don't want there to be confusion by us. But as ambassadors for Christ, and as we stand and as we promote the gospel, that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day, as we do that, we need to be crystal clear. So there's no doubt in the hearer's mind what's being communicated to them. As I look around the room, I know most of you, some of you I don't know. If you're sitting here today, you know, any any time it's amazing you sit in a crowd and there are people here that are not saved. We've been talking about the gospel and the presentation of it. Faith is a private matter. It happens in your heart. You don't walk an aisle to have faith. You have it over here in your heart. The object of your faith is the issue. And the fact that Christ died for your sins and was buried and rose again the third day, that's it. You're hopeless. Job said, to, "There, how, how can a man be just before God? Boy, what a question. Well, how can he? By trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ and the finished work at Calvary. And when that happens, and you know what you stand? You stand there justified. And then you have peace and you've got a life in Christ. You ought to ask yourself sometimes, what if I stood before God and He said, why should I let you into my heaven? What would your answer be? What would your answer be? Because if your answer isn't that Christ died for my sins, then you're going to be ushered to the gates of hell. It's that important, and it's that critical. Okay? All right. Dear Holy Father, we thank You for the morning, Lord. We thank You for Your Word. We thank you for everything that we have in your Son, for everything that you've given to us, life everlasting, peace and joy and hope. We'll give you the praise and the glory for everything. In your name we pray. Amen.
All right. 